Good day. Welcome to Bootlosophy. Uh, for those of you new here, my name is Tech, and I talk about boots. I give boot reviews and look at all things boot related. Today, I'm reviewing the Parkhurst Allen boot in Spruce Kudu. This has got to be the ultimate green boot, whether you're the Hulk or not. <laughs> This is the Parkhurst Allen boot in the makeup that they call Spruce Kudu. I've had these boots for about nine months now, worn regularly but not hard as you can see. Just enough, I think, to tell you how they stand up and what they wear like. Now, before I launch into the boot review, just a quick word about Parkhurst. If you want a more detailed description of the company, I go into some lengths to uh, describe the history and their um, ethos uh, in my review of the Richmond and Ray's Reverse Wax Mohawk, which I'll put a link to uh, up here and also down in the description below. Now, Parkhurst is a direct-to-consumer brand. That means they sell directly from their website to cut out the extra margin from a wholesaler. And so the company's able to keep their boots in the mid-US $300 range. Now, I say company, but Parkhurst is really a one-man band. The founder, Andrew Savisco, started the company in 2018 when he saw a market niche for well-made heritage-style boots that were updated in the aesthetics and kept in an affordable price range. Parkus is founded on trying to maintain the experience of generations and trying to do its bit to maintain employment in the trade. So, to manufacture his boots, Park has partnered with a well-established shoe factory in upstate New York. On top of that, uh, the business model included sourcing as much raw material from the U.S. as possible, and where this wasn't possible or where the quality dictated an overseas supplier, he tried to buy through local distributors to try and keep as much of the supply chain feeding American companies as possible. Parkhurst operates as a small batch manufacturer. This means that Parkhurst uses a few base models and then makes them using different leathers in small batches until the material runs out and then goes on to the next batch and different materials. This business model gives Parkhurst a cachet as a boutique manufacturer of unique quality boots, but also gives Parkhurst a disadvantage in that once finished, a particular makeup of boots may not be produced again. That and the COVID amplified supply chain problems meant that in recent times, Parkhurst hasn't been able to provide a continuous flow through of, of product. We've seen times on the websites only showing one or two models, for example. Now, this would be hugely frustrating for Andrew as well as for his customers, and I'm guessing a, a costly time for Parkhurst when it just cannot get the material to make the boots to sell. I'm glad to say that seemed to be improving, with some originally showed 2021 models starting to appear now in mid-2022. Now, that's a roundabout way of uh, telling you that this model of Parkhurst's Allen boot in Spruce Kudu is no longer available. Andrew has been uh, seen on social media though that uh, he says it doesn't necessarily rule out that it won't be made again. So for those who missed out, I guess you have to hope for the best. But why am I reviewing a boot you may not be able to buy? Well, firstly, it may be made again. Second, it's one version of a key Parker's design called the Allen boot. And you may want to know what that design and the last it's modeled on wears like. And the third reason, I believe this is representative of Parkhurst's overall build quality and innovative use of leathers, uh, in this case Kudu, uh, that I think you might want to know about. This iteration of the Allen boot is in Kudu, from the Charles F. State Tannery in the UK. Kudu is a South African antelope that runs free range. The hides are sourced sustainably. No animals are killed just for their hide. The governments in South Africa, Zimbabwe and Namibia control the population of these animals that otherwise harm crops and agriculture by culling them from time to time. The meat is distributed amongst the local population and the hides that would otherwise go to waste are sold to tanneries around the world. Now, let's get a look at the leather. Let me move closer to the camera here. The animal is, as I said, free range. So it lives in the savanna and gets scratched by thorns hunted by predators and accumulates a lot of marks and scars. Kudu leather is an exotic leather, as you can see here, 
accumulating the life experiences of the animal. It's a mid to lightweight leather, supple yet tough, and full of character. Some bootmakers like Grant Stone will make a reverse version of Kudu leather boot. Some bootmakers also lightly wax the leather. In this case, Parkers leaves the leather quite dry to the touch, which means it has a tactile feel to it that reinforces each whorl and scar. And it doesn't feel like there's a layer of wax that makes the surface smooth and without character. In this makeup, the rough and gnarly green kudu is made into Parkhurst's plain toe surface boot called the Allen boot. It's a dressy, uh, very nicely shaped six inch surface boot. The profile is a sleek and low volume design in the vamp and in the toe box. And from the top, it's wide at the ball of the foot, but then uh, slims down toward the toe before it rounds off at the toe. In many ways, this is the archetypal service boot, but uh, sleek down to make a dressy design. I say dressy design and the profile shows that, but clearly this is a casual boot. I'm pretty sure nobody wears it with a suit, not even a green suit. The gnarly kudu leather, uh, the fact that it's green, and the tan split reverse welt, I'll talk about that when I talk about construction, uh, makes this a very casual boot. Sure, I believe you can wear uh, it as a dressy casual, not quite business casual, but we say chinos and a dressy casual shirt like an Oxford cloth button down. Uh, jeans, definitely. Any denims will go with this, whether light denim, dark denim, or selvage and faded. Uh, it will go with all kinds of chinos and five pocket pants, and potentially even wool trousers if you dress them down up top with a t-shirt and layers, or a flannel and a leather and bomber jacket. You can wear it with pretty much any colour except green. Do not wear it with green, unless you're a leprechaun. It doesn't work. I actually find the best combos for these boots are simple and unobtrusive colours. Uh, all black is my favourite when I pull out these boots, or greys or khakis uh, and other brown shades. I think the key is to pull everything else back and let the green pop on your feet. Oh, and by the way, is the Spruce Kudu Allen boot only for hipsters and Instagram influencers? No, sir. As I go to the construction, I think these are strong enough to wear as light work boots, to mow the lawn, for example. Not to build a house or anything, but if you're working in the yard or in the workshop, no problem at all if you don't mind bashing up this lovely green. Go check out on Instagram how Sky Boot Guy wears them in his shop. On that note, let's take a look at how these boots are put together. The upper panels are stitched together with a combination of double and triple stitching, depending on where strength is required. It's a triple, a tri triple stitch in a 2 plus 1 pattern here in the lower quarter. Uh, in the two-piece uh, back stays, a single panel up the back uh, of the shaft and the heel cup, they're double stitched. Uh, the quarters around the eyelets and at the collar are single stitched, no great strength required there. It has um, seven eyelets, no speed hooks. And the hardware is a kind of painted brown, I think, or uh, olive green brown. The boots come with two pairs of round cotton laces, but I switched them up here to green leather laces. I just think these add to the ruggedness of the green kudu. The, the tongue is semi-gusseted up to the uh, third eyelet. Uh, there's a structured toe box, lightly structured. It has a little reinforcement, enough to keep the shape but soft to press. I think there is a celastic toe box in there. Um, celastic is a man-made thermoplastic that you can shape when warm and lots of bootmakers use it these days instead of leather. There's the same celastic heel counter under this backstay. It keeps the shape of the heel and gives your foot support around the heel. Inside the uppers, the boot is lined with a 2 ounce veg 10 leather in the toe and vamp, but unlined up the shaft and the tongue is unlined. That's actually a pretty heavy weight leather for lining. Most boots use lining leathers around one to one and a half ounces. The uppers are built around, in this case, Parkhurst's current 602 last. A last is the foot-shaped mold that bootmakers shape the uppers around to form the shape of the boot. You sew the sections of the uppers together, and then you wrap the floppy uppers around the last, tighten it to create the shape, and then sew the soles on. So the boot brand's last is very important, not only to create the aesthetic shape of the boot, but also for the comfort factor of how it fits your feet. I'll talk more about the 602 last when I talk about uh, sizing and comfort. The uppers are sewn to the soles using the Goodyear welted construction method. A welt is a strip of leather that you see here that goes around the edge of the boot. Generally, the inside edge of the welt is sewn to the uppers and the insole on the inside, 
and the outside edge is sewn through the midsole and the outsole, as you can see here from this stitching. In this case, it's a 360 degree Goodyear welt. It goes all the way around the boot and is technically a split reverse Goodyear welt. A normal welt is split halfway through on the inside. The bottom half is sewn to the insole and uppers as normal. The upper half is flanged back and against the uppers on the outside as seen here. A Goodyear welted shoe is resolvable. A cobbler can just undo these outside stitches and stitch on a new outsole without damaging the upper's leather, without touching it really. And a Goodyear welted shoe is also more water resistant. The welt creates like a, a barrier between the insoles, uppers and the outsole. So no stitch holes go straight through from outside to inside the boot. In this case, a split reverse welt increases the water resistance. You can see how this flange creates an extra barrier. Let's go back inside the boot. The insole is a three and a half to four mil veg tanned Benz leather, uh, leather from the tough back of the cow. On top of that at the heel is a heel pad and some foam to give you a bit of extra shock absorption, uh, absorption in the heel stripe. Below the insole is a cork filling. If you think about it, when you put the thick leather welt around the outside edge of the shoe, it creates a bit of a cavity inside the welt. The cork layer fills this in so your feet don't feel the edge of the welt, which can be uncomfortable, uh, and it provides more shock absorption. For boot purists, this leather insole and cork filling is the gold standard of insole construction. Uh, leather and cork will compress with the pressure of your weight and it creates a shape that is unique to the lumps and bumps of your feet, creating a customized feel over time. Embedded in the cork layer is a fiberglass shank running from here to here. A shank is a kind of ice cream stick shaped piece of firm material, usually steel, sometimes wood or hardened leather, but in this case fiberglass. It gives you arch support so that the pressure of your feet don't push this gap between the heel and the, he uh, the ball and the heel down, causing foot tightness over the day. It also gives the boot extra rigidity, uh, especially torsion rigidity, when you step over uneven rocks and sharp edges. Moving further down, apart from the Benz leather insole, there's another Veg10 Benz leather midsole, that's this layer here, that you see just below the wheel welt. Uh, then the rubber outsole is glued on top of the midsole and the Goodyear stitch goes through the whole lot. The heel is stacked leather and the rubber top lift for grip and shock absorption. In this case, the rubber outsole and top lift is from Daynight, a UK-based sole manufacturer. You can tell by these relatively low profile studs. Uh, Daynight is a very popular sole choice on many boots. Some boot makers even make their own proprietary uh, rubber soles that look exactly like this. I'm thinking Thursday and Grant Stone as prime examples. If you want to take a look at Thursday's version, take a look at my review of the Thursday Captain Boot, which I'll put in a link up here. The Grant Stone version is very similar, but has, a, has slightly smaller lugs and a different heel layer without this smiley face. You can check that out in this unboxing of the Grant Stone 10SX diesel boot here. Dana is popular because of the low profile, as well as the grip, I think. The low profile means that it looks like a normal shoe, you know, no aggressive commando lugs or looking too outdoorsy. The grip is pretty reasonable, at least for my use case scenarios. I live in a climate that doesn't snow and there's uh, no ice on the ground, so I can't talk about that. But I mainly use my boots in an urban scenario, uh, you know, across cement, pavement, grass lawns, uh, carpets, offices. Uh, I've worn day night on a walk, I hesitate to call it a hike with no issues at all. Now, let's turn to how you might care for these boots. First, I hope you brush your boots with a good quality horsehair brush. If not every time you wore then at least most times you wear them. Uh, that's the first rule of boot care. Okay, you know, boot collectors, boot nerds and boot heads love conditioning their boots almost as soon as they get them. I have a huge collection of boot oils, boot creams, boot conditioners and boot polishes and like many boot fans, I love taking care of my boots. And more often than not, I have to tell myself to leave it alone. <laughs> uh, but at some stage, you probably are going to have to clean your boots and if they're really dry, you're going to have to condition your leathers. Parkhurst recommends that you use Smith's Leather Balm or any natural applicant or wax. Parkhurst also recommends a new but a waterproofing spray. 
Uh, several people in my Facebook boot enthusiast group say that they've tried the Smith's Leather Balm and found that it darkens the green kudu, uh, and some of them recommend just big four if you don't want to darken this leather. In my opinion, it's actually quite difficult to choose what to use, but this is my advice. This is quite a dry leather. As much as possible, like suede, I would leave it alone. It's not that you can feel that it's dry and needs conditioning. I mean, it feels dry anyway, out of the box. If you really had to clean it, again, I'd treat it like suede and use a suede eraser to remove spots and stains. If that doesn't work, I'd use a damp cloth to wipe it over and also remove dust and mud if that's accumulated. If that doesn't work and it really needs cleaning, then and only then would I consider a gentle leather cleaner, not saddle soap, but something like leather honey leather cleaner, and follow the instructions. I'll leave a link to some of these products in the description below. If you really, really need it to condition this leather, then I'd try Big Four, or I think I might prefer a suede conditioning spray like something from Timberland for their new buck, or something from Echo for their suede, or ultimately a Sophia product called Renovateur Suede and New Buck Spray. Once clean and conditioned, you can waterproof it by using a Tarago product called Nano Protector Spray. If you don't mind darkening the leather or leaving a slightly waxy sheen to it, then and only then would I experiment with balms like the Smiths. But a word of warning, the look and textures will definitely change. Okay, that's the construction and leather care. What about sizing and comfort? Parkhurst's 602 last is the perfect last for my feet. They and the Grantstone Leo last and the Alden True Balance last are anatomically perfect for my feet. In all three, my heel is fitted snugly, the waist is hugged, uh, then the lasts open out so that neither the ball of my feet nor my toes ever feel cramped. Most American manufacturers seem to run large and most will advise you to come down half a size from True. I take a size 8 in Parker's boots. Parkers don't really offer different widths. The 602 last is a combination last, primarily a D width, but opening to an E width in the forefoot. If you need wider widths, I'd recommend you contact Andrew by email. Uh, it, his email is available on his website. Check with him, give him the different brands you wear and the sizes you take. I mean, you may have to size up to accommodate particularly wide feet, and I suppose it is possible that the Parkers last may just not suit your feet but I think Andrew will be able to advise a fitting that suits you. In my size 8s, my parkas are perfect. As I said before, the heel and waist around the arch are snug to hold the back half of my feet. The ball of my feet and my toes in this rounded toe box don't feel any pressure at all. The vamp is quite low volume. My feet and ankles are fine, but if your feet are higher volume, it's possible that your toes may start to feel the top of the vamp and the toe box on them. Uh, for me, there was no breaking. The kudu leather is very supple. Despite the double bends midsoles, I find their flexibility quick to adapt to how I flex my foot. The arch support, however, was okay. Not great, just okay. Um, when you order, you have the option of paying an extra, I think it's 40 US dollars, for extra arch support to be built in. If you feel uh, that you need to, you can do that. Overall, because of the last and the leather cork rubber combination under your feet, Shock absorption is uh, pretty good. Um, okay, I haven't run in these, but walking on hard floors like concrete, pavements and urban flooring, uh, my feet hold up well. Let's turn to the value of these Parker's boots. All Parker's boots are in the mid-US $300 range. These cost me $328 in June 2021. That was about $420 Aussie dollars at the time. So compared to cheap uh, footwear like Echo or local high street fashion brands, not cheap. But take a look at RM Williams at 595 Aussie dollars. In Australia, you can buy Red Wing Iron Ranges for about 528 Aussie dollars. Wolverine sell for about 570 Aussie. These are the quality comparisons you should make. All good your welted, well-made boots with leathers from Halloween and CF Stead, amongst other well-known tanneries. They compare pretty well in price. As for value, uh, that very subjective measure, let's tick through what you get. Good your welted construction the gold standard if you like. Unique leather from renowned Charles F. Stead Tannery. Great last, so great fit and comfort. Well-known day-night sole. Uh, solid leather and cork construction. Pretty good QC, no loose stitches, uh, no uh, badly sewn uh, leathers, no holes where they shouldn't be. 
uh, nothing fallen off after these last nine months or so of steady wear. I can't really think of any negatives except that maybe they're not particularly versatile. They are fully casual and you do have to be careful what you wear them with if you don't want to look loud or like it's permanent St. Paddy's Day. Um, so overall, as subjective as it is, yeah, in my opinion, I think they come out pretty good value. Well, there you have it. That's my personal take on the Parker's Allen boot in Spruce Kudu. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Before I go, here's where I get you to help me out. So, if you like the review, I'd really appreciate it if you click on the like button below, and I'd be super appreciative if you could also click on subscribe. And besides, I'm going to release a lot more boot reviews and unboxings and maybe other uh, boot and leather related videos. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, subscribing will mean that when I release these videos, YouTube will put them up in your feed to remind you to watch. Thanks for that. Hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you again in the next video soon.